I gave this lecture last Jan no, December in Seattle, Washington, um, as the invited Wilhelm Stephenson lecturer for 2018. We squeaked it in in December. It's been going for about 10 years, funded by the Evelyn Neff Stephenson Fund, which she created in honor of her husband, the great explorer. And uh, so I want to acknowledge her for funding this work. So I would also like to acknowledge that we live and learn on the uh, territory of the uh, Coast Salish First Nations, uh, and I'm going to give them in a little different order this time. Soak, because I work with them. Um, <laughs> Kosamson and Lukonguin, and I've missed one out, Sianu. Um, so thank you to them for allowing us to work and learn on their territory. So Wilhelmer Stephenson was um, acknowledged as a great explorer. He was born in Iceland, but moved at a young age to Gimli, Manitoba. And so I always like to claim him as a Canadian. And he um, did some wonderful work in the North, and he was known as the Arctic Dreamer, and he wrote about 50 publications on the North. Uh, so he's a fitting person for me to acknowledge in this work. Uh, nearly 100 years before him was John Ray, who was born in Orkney, so I have a special connection to him, and I'm now working on a John Ray Center for Research on Climate Change in the North, um, which might be in Orkney. There's a lot of vying for where it's actually going to be. But this is his birthplace in Orfeur, Orkney, and uh, Ray was known for learning from northern people, and Stephenson took his cue from Ray, because Ray survived and was able to succeed in his explorations because he listened to northern people, and he learned from them. And the, I love the uh, sculpture in the St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall, Orkney, because there's John Way wearing moccasins, um, and, and moccasins right up to his knees, and all uh, Inuit clothing, and uh, obviously keeping warm by doing that. So Ray and Stephenson all learned how to live in the Arctic from northern people. So this is um, one of the expeditions in search of the Franklin expedition um, by Charles Francis Hall. And so you can see what they learned from northern people. They learned to use dogs. They learned, learned to sew their clothing. They learned to hunt and fish and go out on the ice. There's seals in the foreground. They learned to travel by umiak and dog team. And so they basically learned how to survive uh, in the Arctic. And my premise is that climate researchers are the new explorers in the Arctic. Many of those climate researchers went to the Arctic, measured ice loss, measured all the dynamics of the ecosystem, and I have no quarrel with that, but they ignored the fact that there were people living there. Whereas I think that the successful climate researchers, the ones who get a really good overall holistic picture of what's going on in the Arctic, and let's face it, that's what will be going on in the lower uh, latitudes, um, do it by listening to northern people. So this, in large part, our survival and future depend on the lessons we're learning from the north, on the front lines of climate change and biodiversity loss, and how to thrive and adapt in conditions of dramatic uncertainty and change. So this is what I'll talk about today. I hope to get it into half an hour, but I'm not sure I will. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about how learning from northern people, traditional ecological knowledge and local knowledge, and how we learn about climate change through that knowledge. Um, I'll talk about the way my research from basically the beginning of my academic career has led up to my current research um, that Walter in the background is now going to be working on as my postdoc. And that current research is Northern Knowledge for Resilience, Sustainable Environments, and Adaptation in Coastal Communities. 
So what we talk about is indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, and local knowledge. And the problem here is that some knowledge systems have traditionally, I shouldn't use the word traditionally, have always been privileged over other knowledge systems. And that poses a real problem for us learning about the environment in the North. So Northern people are the canary in the coal mine of the planet. Um, they are experiencing the impacts of climate change first and greatest sea ice loss, permafrost loss, sea level rise, coastal erosion, temperature, biodiversity, species ranges. And those in turn have an impact on livelihoods, food security, indeed identity. And Stephenson wrote a book called The Friendly Arctic because he wanted to show that the Arctic wasn't this forbidding place where we all die if we go there. Um, but Arctic residents are beginning to doubt that the Arctic is still as friendly as it once was because they can no longer live in the same way. And many of the climate activists in the Arctic are talking about the right to be cold, although that sort of passed them by. I gave this lecture in the context of this disastrous decline in sea ice in the Bering Sea. Uh, this was 2018, and it had just been published when I went to Seattle. And as you can see, this is a catastrophic loss of sea ice. And this, of course, was only the beginning. This came from the National Snow and Ice Data Center and uh, was very dramatic. So after that, in the eight months intervening, we've seen the loss of the Greenland ice sheet in catastrophic proportions. We've seen the Amazon fires, not the Arctic, but you're all hearing about these direct impacts of climate change. And in the lower right is a photograph of a funeral that was held in Iceland for the glacier that's just north of Reykjavik. And they grieved the loss of this glacier and set up a plaque there. So the impacts are great. And you're all familiar with the warning that was sounded by the IPCC in their special report number 15, where they said we have 12 years to avoid catastrophic climate change. But more important in that report, I think, is what they said. They said local and indigenous knowledge is important for limiting global warning. Warming, <laughs> warning too. <laughs> um, and what we need to do to listen to that knowledge um, in order to have any hope of achieving the 1.5 degree pathway. Um, I, talk, I talk mainly about Northern Canada, but my research is also in Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, um, and in fact, all of the circumpolar Arctic. Um, and uh, my focus really is on traditional ecological knowledge. And Walter here will be working on traditional ecological knowledge in the implementation of the Sea Land People Plan of Haida Gwaii for Guayanas. Um, and uh, that's going to be very interesting. This is Nuke, Greenland. Um, where people are really starting to investigate what local people in Greenland um, know and about climate change and how they adapt. And a recent study out in the last few weeks from Denmark looked at the impact of climate change on Greenlanders. And people are calling it um, ecological grief or ecological trauma, whichever way you want to look at. And they talk about the impact on mental health of Greenlanders um, of the impacts of climate change. And it's so touching because I listened to a report of one man who'd had to kill his dogs. And um, they say that the dogs are really the endangered species in Greenland because they can't run dogs anymore. People are dying, drowning, because the ice is unstable now, so they can no longer do transportation, hunting, and fishing on the ice the way they did. And so this is a dramatic loss of their traditional livelihood. And their, their grief shows through, and their mental health is badly affected by it. 
So how have we used ecological knowledge? One of the most dramatic ways that we've used ecological knowledge, indigenous ecological knowledge, was finding the Franklin expedition. Now John Ray knew what had happened to the Franklin expedition, and he told the British government and society what had happened, but he made the mistake of suggesting that there was cannibalism uh, at the end uh, among the survivors, which has since been proved to be correct. But the British establishment just could not hear of that among the gentlemen classes, and I emphasize men classes. Um, and so Ray was ostracized from the British establishment, and he never regained his reputation. And most of that was led by Lady Franklin. Hell hath no fury. She uh, really set about to uh, make sure that Franklin's legacy was primary and that John Ray was ex um, just completely forgotten. So this is the terror in 1848. And finding, Parks Canada, of course, as you all know, set about to find the Erebus and the terror. And they engaged the help of this man, Louis Kamukak. And uh, he is known as an Inuit historian. He knew where the remains of the ship were. He guided Parks Canada to where they were. And indeed, they found the Erebus in 2014. Unfortunately, Louis Kamukak is now no more. So in the last 20 years or so, we've had many, many, many studies of traditional ecological knowledge. And people have tried to talk about the way traditional ecological knowledge can be integrated into policy and management of natural resources and ecosystems, with some resistance from the holders of that knowledge, because they wanted to say, we cannot integrate our knowledge into Western scientific, or whatever you want to call it, knowledge. And so recently, people are using words like weaving, uh, braiding, um, adding, uh, whatever. But the point is that you cannot add that knowledge without adding the knowledge holders. And so that means empowering the knowledge holders to make their own decisions and manage their ecosystems in the way that they know so well how to do, because they've lived in those ecosystems for hundreds of years. They know the dynamics. They know the threats. They know the impacts of human action. And so um, they are better placed to uh, manage those ecosystems. And they have been doing it for many, many years. So I have some definitions of traditional in, or, or indigenous knowledge up here. I won't dwell on those, um, but certainly you can find them in any of those publications. So mostly traditional ecological knowledge has been around traditional subsistence. Um, and northern peoples had to understand the ecosystem because they depended on it for their lives. More recently, um, Traditional ecological knowledge has been applied to natural resource management and indeed climate change, so that we're learning about climate change. I've been very interested in the transmission of traditional knowledge. We go to school and to universities, but northern peoples learn from each other, and mostly they learn from elders passing on that knowledge to young people, not in the classroom, but out on the land. Um, most governments have not caught up with uh, traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge, but the Northwest Territories actually has a traditional knowledge policy, and this is it. The government recognizes that Aboriginal traditional knowledge is a valid and essential source of information about the natural environment and its resources, and they actually do an annual report on traditional knowledge. And now people are more and more, this is a CBC report, recognizing that if we want to learn about the Arctic and learn about climate change and biodiversity loss in the Arctic, we do need to not just talk to, but listen to northern people who've been living there for generations. And a number of studies have now come out trying to document traditional knowledge related to climate change and other environmental changes. This one is called The Caribou Taste Different Now. 
and that's an excellent book that I recommend. Ashley Consolo Wilcox, whom Chris and I have both worked with, um, did a film and a study called Lament for the Land, uh, gain on the mental health of people in Labrador uh, as a result of the impact of climate change. Uh, this was field work that I and my co-researcher Astrid Ogilvie did quite a long time ago. And we went into a home and they talked about this knife that they used for making snow houses, but they said that the snow is no good anymore and they can't make those houses. This is the uh, I still can't get my mouth around some of these words, trails project that Sherry Gearhart from the University of Colorado did. And she fitted hunters with GPS recorders. And so she was able to track where they went and the conditions that existed where they went. Wonderful study. And some of our very own st students here have done uh, projects on indigenous knowledge. Uh, one, Neil McGrath wrote about indigenous knowledge and environmental co-management in Yukon, and we've had several others. So co-management is the, one of the mo more recent attempts to incorporate traditional knowledge through cooperative management between governments and knowledge holders. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. And there have been many, many studies that have shown that when you put these two entities, governments, settler governments, and First Nations or Inuit land managers and knowledge holders together, the government knowledge system is prejudiced and privileged over the other knowledge system. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> I do have a cold. Thank you. Robin. There have been many studies about the failures of co-management, and most of those failures are due to power differences in the um, participants of those tables. <coughs> and also this for forlorn attempt to integrate knowledge. So my past and current research has led up to the research I'm currently doing. Thank you very much. I'm not going to go through these in any detail because most of you know about most of my research. But I'm trying to make a picture of how the findings from these different research projects have led me to where I am now in my current research. So in 2004, this climate assessment came out, impacts of a warm, warming Arctic. And that was really the shot across the bow about what was happening in the Arctic, and that was followed very quickly in 2005 by the Arctic Human Development Report. The Arctic Human Development Report was very interesting because it said, we can use the UN development indicators to see what the quality of life is in the Arctic for residents of the Arctic. But the people who wrote the report said, you know, it's not gonna work. We need different indicators of the quality of life in Arctic residents. And um, earlier than that, I had been involved with a small group of six people who wrote a perspective, prospectus or guide for research in the Arctic. And um, that was called People in the Arctic because we wanted to signal that there were actually people living in the Arctic and that we had to do research on the human dimensions of the Arctic system. And so that really set the stage for some of these subsequent publications. By the way, we met at a uh, Northern Lights Lodge in Northern Alaska. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. And, and they also had sandhill cranes there. And we had to work all day and, uh, for about four days on writing this prospectus in this gorgeous environment. About the same time in 2004, I did a study in Northern BC called Competing or Conflicting, the reviewers never liked conflicting knowledge systems in the Pacific Northwest. And there I really documented the way in which First Nations had been living in these environments for centuries, knew all about them, and then 
religion came, uh, missionaries came, the settler governments came, the dominion government came, and they completely overrode that knowledge and undermined the institutions that First Nations had for managing their environment and for sharing the uh, products of that management among themselves. And uh, many studies have recently, like Charles Menzies, documented how disastrous that was for the ecosystem, and especially in fisheries on the coast. So I talked about this, this conflict between DFO primarily, the people in the north just despised DFO, and the colonial governments for the way they undermined policy. So my claim was that First Nations knowledge systems guide ancient management re regimes that govern access, rights, and responsibilities, in other words, governance. So I've since become very focused on the way knowledge is used in governance and the way uh, traditional values and knowledge can be incorporated into environmental governance. Govern access, rights and responsibility, harvesting, allocation of benefits and costs, technology education, and training. Conflict with imposed management and knowledge systems, colonial, government, religious, residential schools, who ignored or undermined existing knowledge systems or rules of the game and local institutions. And by doing that, they undermined sustainability. So... These are just a few of those conflicting institutions. Um, Co-management has been lauded as the panacea for integrating uh, traditional knowledge, um, and it has had its benefits. This is the uh, Nishka co-management regime, and I also studied the Haida co-management regime. And the Haida one is very, very interesting because when they set out to manage Guayanas, they wrote the agreement on two pages, on two sides of the paper, because they could not agree on how to manage. And so in the end, they just said, look, let's agree to disagree and do what we can. So they wrote the Constitution down on two sides of the paper. And, uh, you know, that's also known, um, I've forgotten his name, our Governor General's husband, Adrian Clarkson's husband. Philosopher, oh, come on, Shirley. Sorry? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Comes from a librarian. John Ralston Saul ref um, reflected on the uh, two strand wampum, and it's very much the same idea. Thank you, Rosie. <laughs> Brain dead. When I wrote that study, whew, what was that, 15 years ago, people started using it in the classroom. And uh, people wrote to me and said, can we use this in our, um, our, our tables for, what do you call those tables for um, uh, agreements, land agreements, et cetera. And I always said, yes, but I'm really embarrassed about it. And this is the reason I'm embarrassed. I talked about all kinds of knowledge, but I never talked about women's knowledge. And so now I'm doing it again and this time I won't fail <laughs> to talk about women's knowledge, which of course is so important when you're talking about natural resources. Other projects, coastal zones at risk, of course, this you know, really reinforced my age-old interest in coastal communities because of course I grew up in one in Vancouver. Um, I was a founding member of the University of the Arctic, and there I developed something called an advanced emphasis, which is basically the same as a major in Arctic climate change. And in that, we really tried hard to include indigenous scholars, and we did right from the very beginning in the design of the program and in the design of the courses. I hate to say it, but we never got that through. It never happened. But now, it's happening at Royal Roads University. Uh, so we now have, starting in September 2020, the Science and Policy of Climate Change as a graduate certificate, and I'm very excited about that. Okay, then along came in 2007 and eight, how am I doing for time? Oh, oh, I better, I, I better move it along, sorry. Um, <clears throat> IPY. 
And I was on the executive committee of the Canadian IPY committee. And there, there was a real attempt for the first time to incorporate the human dimensions of climate change. And we actually put it in the prospectus and in the call for proposals. And we funded a lot of proposals on the human dimensions of climate change. And as I mentioned before, the Arctic Human Development Report. And then leading from the Arctic Human Development Report, I was involved in the Social Indicators Project. And the Social Indicators Project was really interesting because remember I said that the human development indicators didn't work in the Arctic. And the reason that they didn't work, they were fine. You know, they did um, uh, money, income, uh, health, education. But they needed to do more. They needed to talk about the relationship with the natural environment, with cultural integrity, and with something that we called fate control, which is the power of people to control their own destiny. And of course, Arctic residents, ever since we discovered the Arctic, has all, have always been a prey to um, governments in the South who know nothing about them and uh, don't care. So we added those three, and I was in charge of the contact with nature um, indicator, and we did a big study on uh, what that meant and what a good indicator for it was. And we came up with the consumption and harvest of traditional food as the best indicator of well-being of Arctic residents if they could still do this. Um, then I worked for ArcticNet. I was in charge of Theme 4, which was the adaptation part, knowledge transfer policies and strategies. We talked a lot about traditional knowledge, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, then along came the project that I was co-PI of called um, Protected Areas in Poverty Reduction, a Canada-Africa Learning Research and Learning Alliance. And there we worked with the colloquia and with Ghana and Tanzania. And the study that I did was about governance and the way in which traditional values can be incorporated in governance. And the colloquia were fascinating because they combined new forms of governance and they used those quite well with their traditional forms of governance. And they talked about the, how the totem poles were their constitution, uh, but they also used ecosystem-based management, GIS, adaptive management, partnerships with NGOs, governments, et cetera, but on their terms. And they created their tribal park, which was a huge act of hubris because, of course, the Canadian government would say that that land is not theirs. But they said, I won't say what they said, but uh, <laughs> they said, and they declared their whole traditional territory a tribal park. And everyone's left it alone. Nobody dares touch it. And, uh, and they're managing it very well. So the lessons learned from that are that outcomes are uncertain, but they're encouraging signs that innovative forms of governance that build on traditional knowledge and values have the potential to ensure sustainability of the resources, as well as enhancing long-term resilience and sustainability. I won't go through meeting the climate change challenge because that's Ann Dale's project, and you've all heard quite a lot about that, but I investigated Soak Nation and Prince George in that project. And then the, um, the Clam Gardens project, which I have also talked about in this room, so I won't go on about it. But it was wonderful as a way of showing that traditional ecological knowledge is very effective as a basis for managing the ecosystem. We didn't know anything about clam gardens until John Harper flew over the BC coast. He had a mapping exercise that he was doing. He kept seeing these structures, and he didn't know what they were. So he landed and talked to the First Nations all up the coast, and they told him what they were. They're ancient structures to enhance clam um, culture and harvesting. And, you know, they're known as, um, uh, you know, fishers of salmon, et cetera, et cetera. But they had to have alternative livelihood strategies. And this was a woman's alternative livelihood strategy. And they'd get up in the middle of the night at low, low tide and harvest the clams. And their structures, walls at the intertidal zone to improve the habitat for clams. And the clams were just enormous. 
And so the productivity of the clam gardens was about 10 times the productivity of a normal clam beach. And it, uh, it, really, it really was the first time that British Columbians have a tendency to think that First Nations sat around and told stories and raked in all the, the wonderful bounty of their environment. When in fact, they were very knowledgeable they were very knowledgeable managers of their environment in a very active way. And they seeded uh, salmon streams. They, they created these wonderful habitats for clams and other shellfish. So it really blew the traditional uh, feeling about the passive hunter-gatherers um, uh, that First Nations were. So I'm, I'm going to stop that. Um, So my two new research projects are Arctic Climate Predictions, Pathways to Resilient Sustainable Societies. Until now, climate models have been huge planetary models, and they're absolutely useless for communities who are trying to adapt to climate change. So what this team on this research project, I'm an international collaborator, the only Canadian on this project, because I'm in charge of synthesis. But what, we, what we're trying to do is to create regional and local models that better show communities what's going to happen in their communities so that they can plan and adapt to those changes. And so half of the project are climate modelers who speak their own language. The other half are the social scientists, like me and several other people, although I also have a natural science background, which helps a lot in this synthesis challenge. Um, but basically, we're, we have to talk to each other, and they have to tell us what the models are showing. We have to tell and work with the communities uh, and help them plan and adapt. So there are six work packages, and I'm in charge of the synthesis work package. And believe me, that's a very tough task, because at our first annual meeting, I'm going to try and finish it quarter two. Our first annual meeting, the modelers got up and told us all about their models. And the social scientists were rolling their eyes. Then in the afternoon, the social scientists talked, and the modelers were rolling their eyes. And it was my job to bring them together, and I'm still working on that tough job. And we're working in Iceland, Greenland, and northern Norway. OK, so now that brings us to NORSEEK. I have four minutes to talk about NORSEEK. And you're going to be hearing a lot about NORSEEK. I'm, I'm the PI of this. <laughs> I forget. I've been working with Astrid for so long that we've changed roles. One of us BI, the other is co-PI. Northern Knowledge for Resilience, Sustainable Environment, and Adaptation in Coastal Communities. I love this photograph of this Airedale in the in with the and, and those dogs hated that Airedale because she was different, but she would not be left at home. She really wanted to run with the huskies. So um, this is an interesting project because it's both synthesis and new knowledge. It's both historical and current and future. And so we're talking to people about how they have adapted to past changes, past dramatic environmental, social, and economic changes, and how that adaptation helps them deal with future changes. So, and the overarching question is, how can governance systems be designed and implemented to incorporate local, indigenous, and scientific knowledge in order to promote adaptive capacity, resilience, and sustainability in the face of rapid social and ecological change in northern coastal communities? I'm not going to go through the methods or any of that. Our case study communities are Haida Gwaii, um, Iceland, Norway, and Scotland, Orkney, and uh, there are photographs of all of those places. This is the Tuk 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 underground locker. I had to go down a ladder that was about 50 feet underground on an icy rungd ladder. I really thought I was going to die, <laughs> but it was very rewarding. Okay, I'm going to finish where I started 
We have much to learn from Arctic societies, communities, and people about how to adapt and thrive in conditions of rapid social and ecological change. Our survival may depend upon it. And of course, we'll be involved in reconciliation, won't we? And in acknowledgement, I want to thank the people and the critters of the Arctic. Thank you. Ha, ah, I made it. <laughs>